Hello and welcome to The Hard Questions. I'm Solomon Terwanja. African leaders and the big giants in the mining sector have been in Cape Town, South Africa, discussing everything minerals and the potential that mineral development has in the growth of Africa's economy and against the backdrop. On this episode, we focus on Uganda's mining sector, looking at the opportunities, the challenges, and the future. We're privileged to be having Mr. Alan Agumia, who is the director at Gecko Minerals, is also the chairman of the Mining Forum. And we will be taking a deep dive into the mining sector in Uganda, something that hasn't been given a lot of media attention, so to speak. We're focusing much more on the oil and gas sector and not really taking a deep look into the mining sector. Mr. Agomia, very, very welcome to the show. It's good to have you today. I'm as excited as everyone else, because I think that the mining sector is one sector that has not been so much in our faces. But welcome to the show. Thank you, Solomon. And thank you for having us. Uh, for once, I think we'll have an opportunity to tell, uh, to tell the country what's happening in the sector. Yeah. The challenges we're facing. I actually didn't know. We have over 27 minerals in Uganda, plus big, big minerals, including gold, iron ore, cobalt, and the 3Ts. And... It's fetching money. I just read the report from UBOS that it contributes about 2.2% of the economy. According to experts, this would actually be much more. But Alan, I wanted you to first of all ground us deeply in the mining sector. Give us a comprehensive overview of this sector. Well, Solomon, it's true we have all these minerals, all right? But we have traces of these minerals. And it's something you need to clarify. If I wake up in the morning and I say we have some nickel, in this country, we only have traces of nickel, all right? So what I would call a mineral is, what I would say we have minerals, if, if I was to say, is if these minerals are commercially viable, if, I, if they're mineable at an, at an economic level, right? So if you have all these traces, it doesn't mean that all of them are commercially viable. Mm -hmm. But yes, we do have traces, we have a number of deposits in country. Uh, a lot of these minerals used to be mined in economic, uh, in the colonial days. Right? which is not happening today. Yeah. yeah. But specifically, which kind of minerals do we have? Um, that are commercially viable. Yes, that are commercially viable. Or, commercially viable, Uganda was known for mining 3T minerals. Uh, it was known uh, 3T minerals. We have tin, tungsten, and tantalite. All right. In the colonial days, in the 1960s, mining in Uganda started in the 1910s, 1920s. That's when the colonials, that's when they started documenting the history of mining, but you, I'm sure you've had the president talking about iron ore that used to be mined long and in the 19 in the 18th centuries, all right. But today we have we used to have three T minerals: tungsten, tin. We have gold. We used to mine beryllium. Uganda used to mine six percent of the beryllium, wild beryllium, what in the that? 1960s. I've never even heard about beryllium. Uh, it's a, beryllium is a is a mineral used in mainly in a, a uh, defense in the defense industry. In nuclear reactors, it's used in, in a couple of mainly aerospace and defense and, and, and spaces like that. Okay. So we, we used to supply 6% in the 1960s. Today wow. we supply nothing, Solomon. Uh, we used to mine a lot of copper. Of course, Uganda was known for copper back in the day. We were, the, we were basically the kings in mining when it comes to the East African region, I can say. And the iron ore? Iron ore was mined at an artisanal level back in the day, unlike today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have, uh, well, what else? If, if we come today, present day today, we, we, I can say we have a lot of iron ore deposits in, in Kabari, in the Kigezi region. We have uh, tin, tungsten mines. We have uh, tantalite mines scattered all over the country. We have marble deposits in Karamoja. We have a lot of gold uh, flying around in different parts of the country. And uh, I can say we have graphite. In, in Kitkum, that, is, that has been discovered. And of course, the rare earth, the new uh, energy change that's coming up, rare earth minerals in, that are being mined by Renzori now. Yeah, you, you paint up an image that back in the 60s and in the earlier days, Uganda's mining sector was yes, very it was, vibrant. It was a boom. In fact, if you have an opportunity of going to Kasese, where I have been so many times, when I walk through the Kilembe mines, and try to walk back in time. I wasn't there, but I can imagine the amount of activity that is that used to be there at that time. I mean, I, I walked there pre recently and I was like, 
everything is in ruins. But it looked like back in the past, it used to be a beehive of activity employing so many people. And I've been wondering to myself, what has changed? What happened? What, what, happened? what went wrong? Um, minerals used to contribute 30% of the country's exports. Wow. Yeah. 30% of the country's exports were minerals. And mainly, you're looking at copper, and some, I don't think we, cobalt wasn't documented, but you had copper and 3T minerals, mainly beryllium and some gold, right? Gold was not as much as, as it is back in the day as it is today. And uh, minerals created a lot of wealth, all right? There was a power dam that, that was running because of Kilembe back in the day, mm -hmm. all right? There was a, a lot, there were hospitals feeding Kilembe mines. Yeah. There was a lot going on. There was a whole, uh, today when you go to Kibali Gold, it has created its own city in Congo, Kibali Gold Mines, all right? As a result of the Kibali Gold Mine, all right? That, that's the power of minerals. Uh, the Baganda have a saying of, uh, I don't know if you've heard that saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard that saying. That saying comes from the, the owner of uh, Nyamliro Wolfram Mine. It was called Bijodoro. He had so much money that people turned him into a proverb in the Bagada. You, you as rich as Bijoto. That's what wealth, that's the kind of wealth minerals could create back in the day, which you don't have today. So. Yeah, which, and the question then, what went wrong? we can ask, if the sector is not as vibrant as it used to be, Back, you said, you know, it used to contribute 30%. Yeah, exports. And 6% uh, to GDP. Right now it's at 2.2. Even less. I think it's even less than that. Yeah, but that's the UBOS report that came out and it put it about 2.2. And I've been asking myself with so many minerals being discovered every day, Mabo in Karamoja, uh, which is being mined as, at, at this time uh, with the copper that we have and the deposits. And I know Kilembe, the president has tried to get... Uh, investors to come and revive it and, you know, mine more copper and export it, but it still hasn't picked off. I know that there are so many mining farms that are now lying in the history of its past, like the glory of its past. The question that we want to ask is why? What changed? What is the problem? Is it, I mean, for example, I know that there are countries that have taken mining very seriously and it has improved their GDP. Now we know we have iron ore, we have copper, we have gold. Oh, by the way, I heard uh, that our second leading, well, they say leading, but the leading export, Uganda, is gold, which makes me feel like we have too much gold into the country, um, and yet the numbers don't tally. But we'll get to the gold issue just shortly. Anand, how would you rate Uganda's mineral development sector? Are we at takeoff? Are we, are we at a tangent? Are we going down? I think we. Where are we? We are nose diving, Solomon. We are nose diving. We're going down. All right. I've been in the mining sector since 2010. Okay, just to give you a background. So over 10 years. So over 10 years, and and let me tell you, mining is is cut into more than a decade. It's cut into mining has like three sec phases. Mm -hmm. All right, three uh, arms that run the mining sector around the world. All right, you have the first. The, 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 the pivot of mining is exploration, all right? And then from exploration, you go to mining. And then from mining, in between there, there's a small section that's usually missed of traders, mineral traders. That's where you have companies like Glencore, Trafigura, those big mining trading companies around the world. And then lastly, you have smelters and refiners, all right, who smelt and refine minerals. Okay. Now, um, since when I joined the sector, I, I, uh, I started out, uh, I was working for a, uh, a Russian company. I was, I was buying uh, and exporting tungsten to, for a Russian company for five years, for, 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 for a long time. I, I've done trading in the region and we used to export tungsten, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, I did it for quite some time, okay? And we were making money. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were traders. We were, we were traders that were supporting a local miner here in Uganda. And we were exporting about 20 tons a year, a, mo a month, sorry, 20 tons a month. Today, we have a problem of the export ban that has, that has engulfed the mineral sector. We can no longer export minerals, Solomon, because government wants us to do value addition locally. That's one. And, and that has been at the core. The thank president you, really has come out thank you very much. and put his foot down and said, we are not exporting raw materials. 
we have to refine and add value to this country because it will bring us more revenue if we, if we add value? Uh, to, to, I think it's a, we need to bust this bubble. When you look at, uh, for example, let's start with copper. I, 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 let's start with copper. Today uh, in Indonesia, there's, a, there's an American company doing a million tons a year of copper. Essentially, if you do the math on that, a million tons, it's doing more than 100 tons a month of copper, or it's melting more than 100 tons a month, all right? Our copper deposits in Kilembe, government wants the, 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 the operator of Kilembe to, to set up a smelting plant as well, because we used to have a smelting plant for copper in, in Jinja back in the day. I was doing, I think, copper billets or copper cathodes. Today, we have smelters that are doing 100 tons a month. There's a, there's a, and and what, what, what they deem as small smelters in the mining industry, for copper specifically, anybody doing less than 250 to 500,000 tons a year is, is a small smelter. 250,000 tons. It's a huge amount, Solomon. Now, our copper, our Kilembe mines in, in Jinja have, uh, we have reserves of about 5 million tons of at 2%, 2%. 5 million tons at 2% is about 100,000 tons of copper deposit. In Kilembe? In Kilembe. We have, yes, we have smelters that are doing that a month in, in Indonesia. All right? They're doing that a month. Our deposit is $100,000. Uh, 100,000 tons at two percent, if because we have five, five million tons at two percent, so essentially that's about 100,000 tons of deposit at 100 percent copper, all right, and you have smelters doing that amount. Mineral refining and smelting is a is a is an economies of scale business, unlike what it used to be back in the day. People who are doing volume are making profit, all right. If you don't have a certain volume, you you can't make profit in smelting. So government's uh, focus should be not smelting. How can we drill more in Kilembe? How can we quantify the deposits in Kilembe further to know if the reserves are much bigger than what they are today? Because if you say that you want to put up a smelting plant in, in, uh, for, for, for Kilembe to, to smelt, to, to do copper cathodes, or it won't be profitable. It's not a profitable business. However, if you say probably you want to make another alloy, process this copper into an alloy, maybe combine it with uh, another metal, that's where countries like China are making profit. Uh, China's rare earth industry makes money from, they don't make money at refining. They make money from other elements that come out from the rare earth magnets that they extract. It's not profitable to refine, but they, they subsidize those industries and make money after on the phones that are produced in China, from the electronics. This is where they make money. They don't make money from smelting. Do we have lithium and uranium in this country? Because it's one of those minerals that the state comes out and they're saying we have deposits and we have, um, we believe that if we explode these minerals, we'll, we'll, we'll grow in terms of our revenue. Uh, Gecko Minerals is doing exploration for lithium in Ntongam currently. And this, this whole story about uh, Lithium batteries, if we can manufacture lithium batteries. A lithium battery Solomon has nine elements, nine components, and nine minerals. Not only lithium is the second smallest in terms of chemical composition in a, in a lithium battery. It's 3%. Graphite is 28%. You have graphite, you have aluminium, you have uh, nickel, you have uh, cobalt, you have copper, you have iron ore, you have manganese, you have uh, steel also. All these minerals are in a lithium battery Solomon. So if you say you want to manufacture a lithium battery in, in Uganda to support Kira Motors, you have to have process, not only uh, mine them and get the ores, you need to refine them, process them to a usable alloy that can be combined and make a, a, a lithium battery. So can we manufacture lithium batteries in this country? I doubt so. so it's, a, it's, a long, it's a long shot, you can't. You have to have processed all these minerals. And if you say you want to assemble them, it, it may not make economic sense because there are countries that have all these things in one place like China. All right. The president has been very particular that Uganda will not export raw materials. And that's why he's pushing for value addition in coffee, value addition with the milk. He also thinks that the same should be for the mining sector. In fact, back in 2015, the president made it clear that his government will not allow exportation of minerals. And if there are any people who want to invest into mineral development or the mining sector should come and establish a plant here 
and then add value to the minerals and perhaps export a finished product or somewhat close to finished product. The view he has is that this will help us get more value out of it rather than just exporting ore without any value addition. You as an expert in the mining sector, is this working out? Solomon, I think this is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not working out in short. Uh, as a miner, I would love to see what the president is advocating for happening in country. We would love to see it as a miner. However, I can tell you for a fact, I have done personally, I've done tin smelting, all right, with some Indian friends of mine. We smelted tin uh, from uh, Mwera Sandu tin mine up to 99%. I have personally enticed Indian investors to set up a tungsten processing plant in country. We were doing a compound called sodium tungsten dehydrate. All right. So we as the private sector have done mineral value addition even before the president came in to tell us to do it. All right. But the challenge that we faced, one with the tungsten uh, uh, refining plant that we had set up in Mukono, we were not making profit, Solomon. The raw supply, there was no enough supply for the plant that we, we, we were running. We required three tons a day of tungsten uh, ore to be able to sustainably fill the plant. We didn't have this amount of tungsten in the country. We, we, we required at least to be dealing with concentrates instead of rough ore because it consumes, uh, rough ore consumes a lot of power compared to if you deal with concentrates because they are higher grades, all right? So we, our plant was three tons per day. We could barely get half a ton per day, okay? So the challenge of mineral value addition is because there's no supply. When it comes to tin, uh, Solomon, we have, a can, we have a plant today, Woodcross, that they're, they're trying to do tin smelting. I can tell you they, there's, there's been a, a tin smelter in, in Rwanda for, for more than a decade called Luna Smelters. They've changed hands a couple of times, but Rwanda is a leading tin exporter, of course, tin concentrate exporter. In, it's the third in the world and number one in Africa. Uh, that plant has been there, but Rwanda still exports concentrates. We've had a plant in Cherwa in Tanzania doing tin smelting, tin ingots, but it's shut down because it's not profitable. So no more. tin smelting is a very, it's a very complex, uh, it's a very complex process to smelt metal. And, and this refers to also all other minerals. It's a very complex system and it's not a profitable system. That's a big thing you've just mentioned there. Yes. Well, while as a country and the president is pushing for value addition, and you've mentioned very clearly, this is a business. People are selling need to make profit. billions of dollars. Thank By you. the time they come to that decision to invest billions of dollars, there are some guarantees that have to be made. Thank you. And one of which you've talked about is exploration to supply the farm. And you've mentioned something very critical here, that we do not have a base that speaks to the amounts of minerals that we have in Uganda, and therefore there is a need to have exploration and study the quantity and amounts. Is that, I just wanted to make sure that I get it. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. When, when you want to do it, I can tell you, if you want to do refining or smelting, this is the value addition the government is pushing for, because it's not pushing for concentrates, all right, which come from the rough ore that we mine, because we were banned from exporting concentrates, all right? So they you want banned from exporting ore and concentrate. And concentrate. Yes. Wow. They want us to export metal to add value on this metal. But we don't know how much we have in the ground, Solomon. How can we get up there? Which it's like wanting to set up an instant coffee plant and to do instant coffee. All right? You don't, yet you don't have coffee in the ground. What are you, what are you doing? How will you feed the coffee smelter? I mean, the coffee processing plant. This is what government is advocating for. We don't have, we've not done quantification of it. And, and let me tell you, Rwanda, back in our neighbor, Rwanda is the biggest exporter of tantalite in the world. It's the biggest exporter of tungsten in the world. China is the biggest, China produces 85% of tungsten in the world. But uh, when it comes to exports, Rwanda is number one. Uh, it's number three when it comes to tin in the world, all right? This, Rwanda lies on the same belt as, as southwestern Uganda lies. We have over 10, I have, we have over 10 mines of tin, 10 mines of, tung, uh, of tungsten, five, six mines of tantalite in southwestern Uganda that are lying dormant, that were left by the colonialists. Today they are not working, Solomon. 
over 10, we're talking about a huge amount of mines that are lying, colonial mines that are lying dormant, that had rail systems that were running. Some of those mines are almost more than half a kilometer long under, under uh, tunnel systems that were left by colonials. All those mines today are dormant, Solomon. Okay? We've not done, we've not given them enough attention. We could be competing with Rwanda. We could even beat it hands down in terms of 3T exports. Let's talk about 3Ts. Okay? But we, they're lying dormant. Why? The private sector has been curtailed. We've been tied down by the export ban. Okay? We cannot mine. If, if, I, if I can't mine and, and export, what am I going to do? I can tell you there's a mine in, in Mitiana that was run by Russians that was mining three uh, tantalite. It shut down because of the export ban. We have Indians that were mining tin in Kisoro that shut down because of the export ban. We have African panther that uh, in, in Isingiro, they are not working because of the export ban. We have I, there was a Samta had a processing plant in Itungamo for, for tin. They shut down because they, they couldn't export these minerals. Okay. So, that's what the export ban has done to us today. We are out of business. I used to export tungsten. We can't do business anymore. We set up a processing plant for tungsten ore, but shut down because it had limited supply. These uh, smelters work on economies of scale. Economies of scale, I need volume. I need to be processing about 100 tons a day to be able to make profit in tin of 20 tons a day. You have a, we can barely produce 20 tons a month. We were exporting 20 tons. We were fighting to export 20 tons of tungsten every month from Yamliro. All right? Those things are not happening today because of export ban. We were employing 1,500 workers in Yamliro, in Rwanda. I don't know why the MP from that place doesn't fight for his miners that were made, rendered jobless because of export ban. They were made, we were paying $10,000 a kilo per day. We were collecting 1.5 tons a day. That money was trickling down to that community on a daily basis. That, that revenue is gone. And what has the export ban done to us? It's a disaster, Solomon. I can tell you, I used to mine iron ore in Makanga in 2013. Those who know Makanga, Makanga is in, uh, just above the golf course in, in, in Kabad, mm -hmm. just behind White Horse Inn. There's an iron ore deposit there, Solomon, that is dead and gone today because we, we were banned from exporting iron ore. The human settlement there has taken up that place today. All right, houses there are going for 400 million. Plots of land are 200 million. You can't buy, you can't do, that deposit in Makanga is dead and gone. Because if we had mined it 10 years ago when we were working eh, and expanded the operation, it would be a different story. But because we were banned from exporting, they, they, it, that area lied, I, lied idle for a long time and people uh, have bought plots of land there. There's so, another deposit in... Uh, so dead, you mean that the minerals will still be there but they will not be explored? You can't explore, you can't mine them because the land there is expensive. You can't buy that land. There's another deposit of iron ore in, near the barracks in Kabali. People, are, the, the plots of land there are selling like a hot cake, but there's an iron ore deposit there. You can't go there today and mine. It has lied idle for a long time. No one is working, so people started settling there. There's, an, there's a Wolfram mine in Kisoro called Kiro Wolfram mine. Um, it had, it, it's probably one of the biggest Wolfram mines in, in, in the region. It's a, I used to buy Wolfram for a fantastic ore from there. That deposit has the land where that mine was seated, that mine was a huge operation, has been encroached on by, by, by people, the land of that mine, has been encroached on by people, over 600 acres of land. To get that mine back into production, you, need, you may find that you need to compensate all these people. It becomes very expensive. And as the years go by, it becomes harder. When, a, when you take an investor there, the first problem you'll see is the people who are on this bridge. And compensating. Compensating them. And, and that's only 10 years from today. What will happen five years from now? And this is because you're not mining. We are not mining. The blind mines are lying idle. You want us to add value. You've not even done exploration. And let me tell you, government can't, I'm not saying, the private, the mining sector around the world is private led. Private -led. It's only led by the government, apart from China, all right? Government doesn't have the amount of money to, to, to pump into a do exploration. Uh, throwing holes, drilling a hole here, one, two, three holes here, doesn't do exploration. It's not exploration. And that's what I was coming to because the president, in his wisdom and advice, says that we need to add value. But when you look at the flip side of what it really means to add value, it means that you have to attract investors that have billions of dollars that are going to pump and set up processing plants and value addition. But like you mentioned, before you set up 
any factory, you have to know the supplies. And therefore, there is need for geological studies that show the amount of raw material that you need that is going to sustain you long term because you said it works on economies of scale. And you're telling us that government has not done enough to explore and give us with some level of precision the amount of minerals that we have in the ground that can be used as a basis for investors to come and invest. It hasn't done, it hasn't, it, it, the government can't do exploration. It's very expensive, Solomon. It's a very expensive exercise. And, and one of the things that... Uh, it took us years to get oil, to, to know the amount of barrels that we have under the ground. Yeah, it took us years, but oil, yeah, oil is a different ball game. And, and are these other minerals also are different ball games. We were in different worlds, all right? Yeah, same theory, but different things. Let me tell you, uh, quantifying a deposit, eh? I'll just give you an example that I know. Kibali gold mine in, 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 uh, in, in Congo took five, four or five years to exploration. They spent over $100 million. They could have done, pumped all this money and found that the, 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 the gold is there, but it's not commercially viable. This has happened, even in Uganda. I know of a deposit that was drilled out. They spent over $20 million. The mineral is there, but the, 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 the purity is low. All right? So you lose that money as an investor. And, and that's, that's the story of, of mining. Solomon, I've been in boardrooms in Bombay, and uh, we've talked to guys on Wall Street, Bay Street, trying to raise money for mines in Uganda. Okay? And one thing they will tell you is that um, we need proof of product. We need to know how long have you been in business, okay? And the only way you can show proof of product if you've been exporting this mineral, all right? You have export permits to that effect to show that I've been paying taxes, I have export permits. Now, our miners don't have that privilege. And, and we, one of the reasons why we fail to get money, raise money that we're trying to raise is because we, we said we are not allowed to export. I can't show export, uh, a proof of export. I don't have export permits. So that's the challenge we have, all right, a among many. And, and when you're in these boardrooms, one of the things they ask you is, uh, who are the big mining companies in your country? Eh? This is the question they ask. We, we, don't ha we have ionic earth. Rare earth is a different uh, type of mineral. It's, it's, you, you can't, it's not an artisanal mineral. You can't do it at an artisanal level. It's a highly specialized mineral. Rare earth minerals are highly specialized minerals that require highly specialized skills. So we can't have them in the same conversation as Adzano gold miners, uh, Adzano iron ore, or T or three T mineral mine, miners. It's a different ballgame. So yes, we have Renzori rare earth, but and Blank or doing graphite in in, in Kitukum. But it's a different. These are different. These are highly specialized minerals. They're not our ordinary minerals. So we don't have any big miner we can talk about in country. But when you look around uh, the region. We used to be the kings. Today, all the countries around us are doing better than us. All right? Rwanda is projecting to do 1.5 billion in mineral exports in 2024. 1.5 billion. They did more than $200 million in 3T exports alone. Uh, and when you don't even look at gold. We, we, Tanzania is a different story. It's on another level. We can't be in the same conversation. But when you move on to Kenya, which would think we are almost at par. Kenya uh, has a company called Best Titanium doing, uh, that's paying has been paying over $54 million. That's close to $200 billion in taxes every year, Solomon. $200 billion. Our refinery is here being muscled to pay $47 billion for the gold exports. Eh? This is one company in, in, in Kenya, Kuali County, based titanium. It's exporting uh, titanium. And it's, it's paying $54 million in taxes. Not, not the value of the commodity, in taxes. You have a company in... Uh, in Kakamega, Western Kenya, next to Busia, all right? That's uh, the Shanti Gold. It's a listed company. All these companies, best team, they're listed companies. Now, when, when you, I'm, 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 an, I'm a miner in Kenya, I'll be boosting of those companies. We don't have, we have very few to boost about in Uganda. And why aren't we attracting these listed companies? I don't know. Let me tell you, uh, back to the issue of what the export ban is doing. Shanti Gold has discovered almost 2 million ounces of gold in Kenya, Solomon. Two million ounces of gold to a layman, this is about 60 tons of gold, all right? Our Wagagai gold deposit in Busia is, is uh, I think, 30 tons of gold. This is less than a million ounces. These guys have two million ounces, all right? Now, the challenge that these guys have is that acquiring land in Busia is very difficult. 
and even to the years to come, are, are these mining operations going to expand? I doubt, because population pressure is high in Busia. Kakamega, the license in Sh for Shanti Gold is almost 500 square kilometers. You can't get a license of, of, of half that in, in, in Busia. You can't. What am I trying to say? If we don't mine these minerals today and minerals. get them out of the ground today, and we are waiting, and you know, for someone that, to come we are waiting for some Muzungu, some Indian or Chinese to come from somewhere, have mercy on us, and put up a smelter for us. We are not doing any initiative as government. Private sector, we've been locked out. Government has pushed for value addition, but it's doing nothing to this effect. I personally, Solomon, in just around COVID, there was a COVID fan from, my ministry, I think, Ministry of Science and Technology. I personally, after failing, after understanding that we couldn't make profit from tin smelting, I wrote a proposal to the, to the, to the fund, COVID fund, for entrepreneurs and stuff like that. I was hoping that they would give me money to see how we could make the process profitable, tin smelting profitable, all right? They rejected my proposal. And I had even I had put in my own money to, to buy with the Indian. We put in, a, we smelted, we spent money. We did tin ingots, 99. I took them and measured them. Solomon, I have the process. I know how to smelt. I, I learned from the Indians. This is technological transfer. The government has no system or policy to help miners or even train our geologists or mining engineers or anybody coming up. Universities are churning out geologists, Solomon. They have nowhere to practice. The government has failed to put up a system to help us. Okay, you want a value addition. What are you doing to help us, the private sector, do some value addition? Nothing. We are sitting and own. we are sitting and waiting for an Indian man or, or Chinese or Muzungu to have mercy on us and say, let me put up something for you and you add value to your minerals. And it is a sad story I'm telling you. People, people lost uh, sources of livelihood. People lost businesses. And, and some of these business, mining business is a mi business that runs on reputation, trust and reputation. You build it, you build it over time. Okay. So when, when certain things like these happen to a sector, it pulls us back years, years back, it sets us back a couple of years. To build what we had built back in the day today is going to be a challenge. Okay. And, 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 and that's we, where have, we, are. we have a very big risk because like you've mentioned, if the private sector is not supported, if we're not doing the, the, bare, the bare basics of attracting investors to pump money into the economy by doing the geological studies, by guaranteeing um, some things like, you know, constant supply of raw materials and, ore, and all other things that are needed for someone to pump, because it's a business. People do cost-benefit analysis. Why would I pump $20 million into the Ugandan economy if I'm not guaranteed with some things? And you, you, you worry so much that these minerals will not be explored and we will, as time goes on, the industry is going to phase out and die completely. It's going to phase out and die completely. We are already on tentacles. Uh, I used to export iron ore, Solomon. All right. Today, um, we are very happy that Tembo Steel, and, and I think government can say we, we've managed to get Tembo Steel. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the success stories they speak about. Success. Yes, it's, it's true. But you need to appreciate the dynamics of the time today. When steel rolling mills was, had a plant in Jinja, the dynamics of the tin business at, back, at that time were different. The price of iron ore was very cheap. Okay? Today, the price of iron ore is, is up there. It's more than 100 and almost $130. It's different. Steel rolling mills was getting coal for, for, smel for, for mixing in the iron ore and smelting from South Africa. Today, Tembo Steel is getting coal from Ruvuma in Tanzania. It's much cheaper and, and more. I can, he can buy ship I mean trailers, not ship loads. If you're, exporting, if you're importing coal from South Africa, you need to buy a whole ship load because it's a bulk mineral. Okay. So Tembo Steel, or, or, or even uh, there are the other steel companies that are coming in on board they are doing this smelting because it's a profitable business to them today. It wasn't 10 years ago or five years ago when Steel Rolling Mills was doing this. Okay, it's profitable today. And, and one thing I can commend uh, Tembo Steel and what these guys are doing is that they've understood that they're only dealing with concentrates. They're doing, dealing with iron ore concentrates, all right? And, and Tembo Steel hasn't got himself involved in the mining. He, he's, he's specializing on what he knows best, and that's refining. Refining. T Steel Rolling Mills was, getting, was doing both. Mining and, and refining at the same time. And I think that's one of the challenges they face. All right? They're dealing with concentrates and they're focused on what they know best. 
I'm not saying that you can't buy random mining, but it helps for you to focus on what you do. It's the law of comparative advantage. It's an economic theory. But if we are able to uh, interest them, to set up, why can't we interest it's, 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 listed it's, companies to come and set up? Let me tell you, Solomon. This is my, mine. It's a business. If I'm not making profit, I want to do it. Okay. There's a use case today. There's, it's profitable today for him to do what he's doing. Okay. And it's fantastic. But it, it's not going to be the case. And every mineral is unique in its own way. What is working for iron won't work for three Ts, won't work for rare earth, won't work for marble in Karaboja. Every mineral is unique in its own way. And let me tell you, uh, just to give you another, every mine around the world has its signature. People can trace the mineral wherever, I, if, if I take concentrate to a plant and they make a complete chemical analysis of that mineral, they can tell you where it's coming from because, based on the, on, the con on the content. How many minerals, what's the content, what's the radioactive nature of this mineral, they can tell you where this mineral is coming from. What am I trying to say? When I was smelting, when we were refining Wolfram to tungsten sodium dehydrate, we, we were getting Wolfram from Buyaga. There's another mine in Gantone called Buyaga Wolfram mine. It's shut down because of the export ban. It was being run by Russians. The Wolfram from Buyaga is a, has manganese and Wolfram together. All right? The, wol, the Wolfram from Kirua is different in terms of chemical composition. The tin from from Wirasandu and the tin from the African panther mine is, 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 is singular. The chemical composition is different. And this affects how refineries work, all right? Today, Tembo Steel is moving all the way to, to Kavali to pick hematite type of iron ore. There's a reason why it's not getting the magnetite iron ore just it's less than 100 kilometers by. All right? The reason it's doing that is because it's very expensive to process magnetite than to process uh, hematite. They are traveling almost 600 kilometers. So what am I trying to say? These minerals are different in types in nature. Because and you of need the mineral composition. The composition. And therefore the refining The refining is different. Okay. All right? I get it. Let's talk about one of the rare minerals, which is gold, which is Uganda's biggest export. Do we have those much gold reserves that we're able to export gold um, that it's our leading export? Gold is a very contentious issue, and I wouldn't want to talk much about. However, I think the problem we are having is 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 uh, listing foreign gold as Ugandan gold, right? And our own deposit our production is getting lost in all that, right? The Ugandan the, the gold we are talking about as a, it's not Ugandan gold, it's foreign gold. So our own mines in Uganda are getting lost in that whole mix. Uh, but I can tell you, I've had a discussion with some of the gold mining association leaders, and they, they will tell you, we were trying to do a rough estimate of how much gold we produce as a country. And I can tell you, if you combine the gold coming out of Movende, Buhweju, Busia, and Karamoja today, you could be producing upwards of 20 kilos, minimum of 20 kilos a day, Solomon. 20 kilos a day, to put a number to it, it's about, the price of gold today is $65,000 a kilo. So it's about $1.3 million a day in gold production. If you compute that in a year, it's, it's more than half a billion dollars in gold production. And all this is coming from Adzano miners. It's, they're not the large-scale miners, Adzano. Uh, if you look at the amount of money, uh, the government, civil society, uh, all these people that are plunged in, in uh, coffee growing. Coffee today is $900 million, almost a billion dollars. But the amount of money that has been put in there to get it to this level is a lot of money. Government in Uganda doesn't support gold mining, doesn't support miners in general. So, but even much more gold mining. But they're still working on themselves and they managed to raise this money. Associations in, in Kenya today are being pushed to be turned into CBOs, community-based organizations, or what you would say a cooperative uh, that we used to run for co in coffee. All right. What, what does that mean? If, if uh, associations were to be turned into CBOs or cooperatives and they buy the gold from their Adzano miners and they export it on their behalf to, and they were given export permits, Solomon, to export this gold to a buyer in India or wherever, they would be able to build a relationship with those people, number one. All right. And in turn, and I guarantee you it will definitely happen, these people that they're selling gold to will eventually fund their exploration programs, help them raise money to increase their production, quantify their deposit. It would be a good thing for these associations. 
Our government is not helping us, Solomon, when it comes to gold. When you, when you look at Tanzania, Tanzania in September last year set, a, set aside money to buy six tons of gold from small, medium, and large-scale miners in Tanzania. Government buying. Government, government there, yeah, they're going to stock up. The central bank in, in Tanzania is stocking up gold as a form of foreign reserve. All right? Wow. So they're, they're, they're stocking up. Uh, they want to buy six tons of gold per year from small and medium scale. And on top of that, the STAMICO, the State Mining Corporation, is advocating for the central bank in, in Tanzania to be funding, to provide uh, loan schemes for, for Adzano miners so that they can increase their production. That's what governments are doing for their miners in, in, in the region. And, and Rwanda is a different story. Our government is not, I don't know of anything. I could be wrong, I'm sorry, but I know nothing being done for Adzano miners in Uganda. We are out here on our own. And on top of that, avenues that would have helped us raise money to increase our production are not, have, have been locked out by export bans, right? If associations would be turning to CBOs and they buy, the, they buy and sell the gold on behalf of Adzano, it would definitely help them uh, have more, a better reputation in terms, because associations in coffee, coffee has a voice because they, have, they, they, have, they, they show money on the table. We don't know how much gold is being produced in Uganda today as Uganda. There's no statistic. There could be, but I, I, I don't know if how, what the numbers are. But I can tell you from my rough estimate we've done, that's what gold is in Uganda. We're probably doing about more than 20, 20 kilos a day. It's half in value. That's, it's, it's a huge amount, Solomon. And uh, when you look at the statistics, uh, JP Morgan, today, the price of gold is at its highest it has ever been, $2,000 an ounce. JP Morgan predicts that by the end of this year, the price of, of gold will be 2,300 an ounce, all right? Uh, and when they look, as some people are saying, in 10 years from today, gold may be about $100,000 a kilo. Okay, so how are we positioning ourselves as government or miners in this to benefit from the future projections? Because gold is not going to go down with all the dynamics happening with, with the Ukraine and now what the, the geopolitics of the, of the world today. Gold is not going to collapse. It's going to go up. So how do we position ourselves to benefit from the upward trend of gold projections in the future? Gold 10 years ago was $40,000 a kilo. Right now it's 65000 Today it's 65000 It's projected to be 120000 by 2033. That's a big it's a sector huge. to and, and I can guarantee you it's going up. We, we've been watching the numbers. We've been watching the numbers. And that means gold the government should up. pay attention to government. it. But there is no system of taxation. You can't, you can't, we don't know how much you're producing. You don't know, uh, you can't These are Tizano, you can't even tax you, them. And, and let me tell you, if you say you're going to tax these people, but they are out there on their own, you're not helping them. Tanzania is giving six, six tons of wool is almost half a billion dollars, Solomon, to just buy ready market. You, you're not going to worry about, I, I had my friend uh, Chividige saying that if we could develop a system where the central bank could be, uh, safekeeping gold for them so that they can benefit. These are all things that we can explore. But we are out here on our own. And, and I'm sorry to say, but what I'm telling you is a fact, Solomon. We, we have, we, we are, we've been out of business for seven years. Mines have shut down. Investors have, have gone back home. Pulling those investors back down here is going to take a lot of time. When you, when you look at uh, the gold industry in India, today, what... It, it's it, the money in India for gold is around uh, jewelry, making jewelry. Okay, what I would advise the government instead of focusing on these small small issues of forty seven billion, when countries are, are raising two hundred, if we have a taxable base of more than a hundred billion, around the refineries, we should be thinking of how could we create a cottage industry around gold refineries. Let's put the youth to to learn how to make jewelry, Rings, yeah. make uh, artifacts from gold learn how to build an industry around gold refineries because we have gold. It's coming from outside. It's not our gold. And we also have our own gold locally. But how do we create a cottage industry around this? Okay? And, and let's, let's build a sector around this idea. Yeah, because I wanted to just talk about Karamoja because yeah. Karamoja is a very interesting area where we hear there is mining of marble, there is mining of other rare earth minerals. I don't know which ones they are. But it's such a rich place, and we hear it's booming. Let me tell you, um, the export ban, on top of banning uh, gold and other uh, uh, treaties and uh, putting us out of business, it's banned the export of marble. All right? Um, marble in Karamoja is, is recent. It's, not, it's, it's been recently discovered. It's not a very old discovery. 
Uh, and it's good marble, I hear. Snow white marble, per perfect marble. We, we, could, we, we, we could probably be having some of the biggest deposits in sub-Saharan Africa going down. Egypt is the biggest exporter of marble in, in Africa. And uh, we, we probably have the same belt or same nature of Egyptian marble, all right? And uh, the government banned the export of marble, saying that they want value addition locally, we want to make tiles, we want to make, uh, it's for the cement factories. Cement factories use limestone. Limestone is old marble. It's marble that has grown and turned it to limestone, okay? Uh, today, the deposits of marble in Karamoja are so in, uh, in thousands of, of square kilometers, okay? We could be exporting marble and we would be making a lot of, mab uh, of money out of marble, uh, blocks. The biggest market for marble in the world is blocks, marble blocks. Not, uh, not, not uh, slates or tiles, all right? It's marble blocks. It constitutes almost 80% of the marble market in the world. Karamoja, we would be marketing Karamoja marble out there in the world, but we, we can't because there is a ban on export of marble because we want to do value addition on marble. Now, let me tell you, Solomon, 80% of the market, like I said, is, 80, is, is marble blocks. We can't export blocks because we want value addition. Today, the, the tile sector, because marble, tiles use marble, uh, marble or limestone to, to, be, to process into tiles. Today, that market is circulated, all right? The, the market for tiles is, tiles are cheap now in the market. We've, had, we've achieved that. Uh, cement, fac uh, cement factories are using limestone. They have more than enough. And I can tell you the percentage that these people are using is less than 5% of the deposits we have. And I'll tell you, I'll give you an, an analogy for that. I, I had a chance of meeting one of the biggest uh, marble miners in India, all right? And he told me he's been mining marble in a 20 piece of acre of land for, since 1994. It's almost 30 years. Okay, he's been mining marble in a 20 piece of acre for, and he can do it for the next generation. All right, 20 acres is less than, is 10% is, is of a square kilometer. All right, we have thousands of square kilometers of marble. So if you say you want to keep it in the ground, if, if human, is, Karamoja yes, is sparsely populated, but if you want to keep it in the ground for future generations, you're missing out on, on the, th you, you're failing to understand the theory of your comparative advantage. This is what you can do best now. And you have more than enough to take you decades. Why are you not exploring? Why, aren't you, why are you stopping? Because the investment appetite there collapsed. Yes, we could say we have gotten... Uh, yeah, but one, what, the argument would be that now we have tile factories coming up. And but you see, they're using marbles. less than 5% of your deposit. They're using 5%. Then attract more factories to set up here because there's supply no, of No, they, they have more than enough. They have more than enough. If I can, if I can mine a 20-acre piece of land and I mine there for, for 30 years, Solomon, just 20 acres. I'm not saying one square kilometer. We have thousands of square kilometers of, of marble in Karamoja. It's a huge amount. Why don't you allow these people? Let me tell you, if we had 10 factories doing marble blocks in, in Karamoja, it would go a long way in solving the security situation there. And we would market Karamoja and build it, as, build it as a brand. Today, if I cut a marble block from Karamoja and I put it on the market, and then I bring a, a marble block from Italy, Solomon, and I put it there, the, price, the Italian marble block will fetch almost 10 times what mine fetches. You know why? Branding. Italy is selling Italian marble. It's a name. It's a brand. It's, been, it's over 100 years old. They're no longer selling marble. They're selling a brand. It's like Nes Nescafe. Nescafe sells a brand Nescafe, not just coffee. So that brand is very expensive, Italian marble. Should we be marketing Karamoja marble as a brand, build a brand for Karamoja in, in the world there? You would train the people of Karamoja how to do these things. They don't know how to do these things, Solomon. You would build a whole cottage industry around marble uh, business in Karamoja. I, I would solve a lot of things. So what can we do moving forward to better the sector as we wrap up? I think government needs to come, to rea to come back to reality. All right, first the situation as it is at the moment. Uh, we can't do what they want us to do. We can't refine metals. And, and, and the more you create monopolies, like what we have now, whereby you're supposed to only sell to one person. That's what monopolies does. Export restrictions have happened around Africa. It's not only the OECD, the o Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, did a report on export restrictions on the, on the, on the manganese uh, industry in Gabon. It did it on the, on the chromium industry in, in Zimbabwe. It did the same with Zambian copper and, and lead. And export restrictions 
don't don't lead to the development of upstream up, 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 up industry. It does not. It's the research has been made about these things. And when Gabon realized it had imposed export restrictions on manganese in Gabon, it's the third, second biggest ex, uh, producer of manganese in the world. And and Krogam in Zimbabwe is the third. It has the biggest deposits in the world. I think fifth or third. And these countries impose export restrictions, but they are big in their space. We we need to realize who we are as Uganda. All right. Thank you very much, Alan Nagumia, for sharing with us. Thank you so much for hosting us, and I hope. Well, I've been speaking uh, with Alan Nagumia, who is the CEO at Gecko Minerals, uh, speaking to us and taking us deeper into the mining sector and what really needs to be done. I forgot to mention that the mining sector has different phases. So it has people have invested big over, um, over I think, $100 million. Those are the big boys. And then you have a little bit below $100 million, right through to $5 million, and then $100,000 for the little, little, big uh, small investors. It's, it's, it's an industry that I think that if the country really focused and became very serious on it, could actually push us. Right now, we are focusing so much onto the oil and gas sector. I was just imagining if we give the same attention to the mine, to the mineral sector as well, I think would we'll, we'll go a very, very long way in, in actually taking advantage of our resources. I mean, think about this, the oil and gas sector, government had to get in to be actively involved. They had to get shareholders. They had to get, you know, Total, Sinop, uh, government had to come in, the Uganda oil company, all focusing on the oil and gas sector. Now we know that we have ores, you know, iron ores, we have the copper mines uh, in Kilembe, we have uh, the three T's. If we just a little bit focused more on that, what would that bring? It's a conversation that we need to have as a country. I'm Solomon Serwanza, and this is The Hard Questions.